Okay, can I start? Yes, please. Okay, <clears throat> welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this lecture uh, on foreign women in the Anglo Boer War. Now, just as a as a background uh, to this lecture, uh, in the late nineteenth century, uh, many women began to realize that the world was opening up to them, so to speak. Um, they became aware of the adventures of women travelers and explorers and missionaries uh, such as Mary Kingsley, who I will be talking about uh, in due course, and uh, Isabel Eberhardt and others. And <clears throat> they saw the stage of war no longer as the exclusive domain of men, and they were increasingly claiming their share in upholding the honor of their country. Um, and after the outbreak of the Second Anglo-Boer War in October 1899, Hundreds of <clears throat> women left for South Africa to assist in the war effort. And uh, they came here for various reasons. Some had uh, philanthropic motives, uh, though with no real intention of roughing it in the bush or on the open felt, while others uh, just came here for sheer excitement. Um, many were hanging around at the Mount Nelson uh, there in gardens where there were lots of uh, British uh, officers and soldiers. So there was plenty of excitement over there. And uh, like they say, in the pursuit of pleasure. But then there were also those who had a genuine desire to do good and help the victims uh, of the war. And they came to Africa from all over the world, from the British colonies such as Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and from pro-Boer countries such as Holland, Belgium, and Germany, and even uh, Russia. Uh, but whatever their origins, they all came to live and work under difficult conditions here in South Africa that were quite foreign to them. Um, and it was especially in the field of nursing and teaching that uh, foreign women made a, a great contribution during the Anglo-Boer War. Uh, for instance, at the height of the war, uh, about 300 women teachers from Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand were recruited to work in the concentration camps that the British had set up for Boer women and children. I'll just go to the first slide here. <clears throat> here you see these uh, Australian, a group of Australian nurses. Um, they were under the uh, command of um, uh, Marta Bidmeet, this is her sitting here. She became very well known in uh, nursing uh, uh, circles in Australia, obviously. Um, and they served, uh, this group served at Weinberg, just around the corner from UCT, and also in Bloemfontein and a few other places. Then the next slide, this is this lady here is Nellie Gould. She was one of the pioneers of uh, Australian um, nursing. Uh, and she, you can see the medals that, that these uh, sisters that they've uh, been awarded. Uh, this was, uh, I think this was during the, the First World War. Um, after, after they've served in the, all of them have served in the, in the Anglo-Boer War. But uh, like I said, she was also one of the uh, the pioneers and became very well known in um, in nursing circles uh, in Australia. And uh, <clears throat> Nelly and her uh, nurses they served. Uh, I can just show you here. This is the hospital at Sterkstrom. This is the first hospital where where they served. Um, this was close to Stormberg. Uh, which was uh, uh, the, the first big clash between the British and the Boers, uh, which uh, was quite a, uh, a setback for, in the beginning for the for the British uh, effort. Uh, they had at Stormberg on 10 December 19, 1899. Uh, they had 26 soldiers uh, killed and 68 wounded, and 600 were taken prisoner by the Boers. Now these um, soldiers, these wounded from uh, from Stormberg, they all came to Sterkstrom Hospital and Nellie Gould and her sisters had to look after them. 
and nurse them back to health. Then <clears throat> the next slide, these are, uh, this is, these three ladies were from the Scandinavian uh, ambulance. These two are sisters, uh, Anna and Elin Lindblom, and this lady here is Hilda Svensson. And they served, um, and they were, they were pro-Boer, of course, and uh, they served on the Western Front, uh, places like Jakobsdal and Paderberg, where uh, General Cronier surrendered with uh, 4,000 men at the end of February. Now, the next slide, this is the Russian-Dutch ambulance. As I said, there were even people coming out to uh, help the Boers from Russia. Um, they also served on the Western Front, also places like Jakobstal and 14 Streams. They were also pro-Boer, and they were under the command of a uh, Russian, uh, Dr. Theodore Weber. Okay, so that is just to, to give you a, a brief background on uh, these people coming from all over the world to assist in the war effort, the British or the worst. Now, I'll get to uh, a full profile of, of one of these individuals. And you, uh, I think a lot of you have uh, already heard of her, a lady called Mary Kingsley from, uh, from England. Uh, let me just show you. That is a uh, quite an iconic uh, photograph of, of Mary Kingsley. Now, she was a, a well-known adventurer and explorer, and her writing uh, challenged the prevailing European notions of racial superior superiority. And uh, obviously, she provoked uh, considerable hostility in her time, uh, not just in England, but uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, she was born in London on 13 October 1862, and she was the only daughter and the el eldest child of the traveler and writer, Dr. George Kingsley. Now, George's brother uh, was the we was uh, the well-known novelist Charles Kingsley. For you, for you who those of you who uh, <clears throat> who study English literature would be familiar with Charles uh, Kingsley. And by 1881, they were living in Kent. And uh, her father, George Kingsley's services were engaged by a group of aristocrats who included the Earl of Pembroke, and he was regularly away from home on voyages to collect information uh, for his medical studies. And Mary had little formal schooling apart from German lessons as a young girl, but she also had access to her father's very extensive library. And just to quote her, she says, the truth was I had a great amusing world of my own. Other people did not know or care about. That was in the books in my father's library. They were mostly old books on the West Indies and old medical books and old travel books and whatnot. And in 1891, the family moved to Cambridge and the brother Charles read law uh, at Cambridge and she studied medicine. Uh, but then uh, their mother became very ill and Mary had to look after her. She was expected to care for her because she was the only one. And uh, father sadly also became uh, very ill and he died in February 1892. And just two months later, mother also died. She was very sick uh, then anyway. Uh, so then uh, Mary and uh, a brother Charles, they uh, split the inheritance uh, from her parents and she was now able to travel to faraway places she always dreamt about. Now her first visit was to Africa <clears throat> where she wanted to complete a book that her father had started writing and the book dealt with the culture of the people of Africa and uh, she made preparations to travel to the west coast of Africa. Um, and people were quite taken aback that, that a woman who was uh, only 30 years old, that she would venture into an unknown continent, uh, darkest Africa as they sought, uh, without the protection of a man. And in 1893, she, uh, 
she found herself in Angola, where she lived with local tribes. Uh, and when she got back, she started preparing for a second trip to Africa, and that was in 1895, uh, when the British Museum agreed to assist her in a study of freshwater fish. Uh, and here in Africa, she's gone to Gabon, uh, and she took the steamboat up the Ogui River, I hope I uh, pronounced that correctly, which was deep into uncharted Fang territory in what was then uh, the old French Congo. Here you can see her traveling on the uh, on this canoe. This there's Mary Kingsley sitting there. That so this is the kind of woman she was, you know, not scared of anything really. Uh, and as she paddled up the river, uh, she collected uh, up to that time unrecorded fish specimens. And three of those specimens were later named after her. Uh, and uh, she was a real daredevil. And she also climbed Mount Cameroon, which was uh, a little over 13,000 feet, which was uh, fairly high. Um, OK, then uh, over the, the next three years, she toured England, uh, giving lectures on Africa. Um, and um, she made enemies of the Church of England because she criticized the missionaries for attempting to westernize the people of Africa. And she wrote two books about her experiences, Travels in West Africa, which was a very well-known one, and <clears throat> which was an immediate bestseller, and West African Studies. Uh, it, it's uh, really worthwhile reading those books. Now, the Second World Anglo-Boer War broke out in October 1899, and that provided Mary with an opportunity tra to travel uh, <clears throat> to Africa once more. And for some time, she had supported and had spoken on behalf of the Colonial Nursing Association in England, and uh, she volunteered her services uh, in South Africa to the association. Uh, and apart from, from the nursing aspect, she considered the possibility of covering the war as a, a correspondent, uh, almost like uh, Lady uh, Sarah Wilson before her. And uh, so on 11 March 1900, she left Liverpool, um, which on, on the mail ship, the Moor, which carried more than 650 British soldiers uh, bound for South Africa. And they docked in Cape Town on the 28th of March, and she lost no time in calling on the principal officer of health, uh, General W.D. Wilson. He was stationed at the castle uh, to inquire about making herself useful at the hospital uh, by by that stage, uh, General Wilson, he had had enough of well-meaning English women uh, who were more of a nuisance uh, than a help at uh, some of these hospitals. So <clears throat> he thought he would just put her off, and he told her that there was a serious situation uh, that had developed in Simonstown at the hospital there. And he suggested that she should take care of the poor patients, and he thought that would now really put her off. But uh, she recounted that incident. She just said, he said, will you go to Simonstown to the Boer prisoners? Evidently expecting I wouldn't. I said, if that's what you want done, then yes, it was. Those prisoners were dying in a way the British authorities, properly so-called, did not approve of. Now, um, these are, this is the, uh, the is a Bellevue. Uh, it was called Bellevue, the Boer Prison of War Camp in Simonstown. There was another one at uh, at <clears throat> Greenpoint, at the the old uh, Greenpoint racetrack. Now, at the time, uh, there were many sick, wounded, uh, and uh, were prisoners of war. They would been sent to Cape Town, uh, especially after the surrender of General Cronier's uh, forces at Paderberg a month before. And the healthy uh, prisoners, they were held in the camps at, at Greenpoint and Simonstown, as I mentioned. And the sick and the wounded, they were 
accommodated on hospital ships in Simons Bay, but these hospital ships were not very well equipped. Um, and they had to prepare uh, a makeshift hospital in the old palace barracks, uh, which was a rather misleading name for the buildings that dated back to 1886, to accommodate the six Boers, uh, but it was desperately short of staff. Okay, so this is these are also Boer uh, prisoners of war in, in Simonstown. Uh, yeah, they look quite uh, respectable, all dressed up, uh, jacket and tie and so on. Um, but in hospital, it, it was quite a different story. This is Simonstown uh, around the turn of the uh, century, old Simonstown. You can see the, the old main road and uh, the British hotel where she stayed at first. This is just up the road and then the barracks hospital. Um, it was called the palace barracks, really. That was uh, further up, uh, further up the road from from the hotel. Um, <clears throat> so when um, when she uh, arrived in Simonstown, uh, she took a room at the British Hotel. This is the British Hotel; it's uh, still there, um, and uh, in in still in very much uh, original condition. And one of the rooms, the room where she actually stayed, that was uh, named, it was named after her. It's still called the Mary Kingsley Room. So if you have a chance, uh, go and have a look. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and uh, incidentally, uh, the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony, Cecil John Rhodes, he also stayed there at some stage. Um, and it, the hotel overlooks uh, the harbour and Falls Bay, so it's it's quite a, a nice view from there. But uh, Mary soon moved to a, a room in the palace barracks. This is the palace barracks it, that was converted into a hospital, and she had a room more towards the back there. Um, and two weeks before uh, Mary arrived in Simonstown, uh, there was a doctor, Gerard Carré, he obviously a French background, and he had been transferred from Weinberg uh, in Cape Town to the palace barracks uh, with the uh, instruction to convert it into decent hospital quarters. And when he got there, he found the, uh, the hospital in a really dreadful state. And he set about converting the old barracks into a hospital uh, consisting of the main building and four wooden iron huts. The main building was divided into smaller wards, each with eight to ten narrow iron beds. And officially, the hospital had 67 beds, but at the height of the typhoid epidemic, there were at least 140 patients. And Dr. Carre was assisted by a Dr. Thomas Hall, uh, who had been a former district surgeon at Jakobstal. Uh, we've mentioned Jakobstal earlier, uh, that was on the Western Front. Uh, and he was, uh, this Dr. Hall was fluent in Dutch, so he facilitated the communication with the Boers. Uh, many of them who did not speak one word of English, and with the English nurses and with uh, Dr. Carre, of course. And at first there were 12 nurses, uh, but only two of them were really trained in nursing. And the rest uh, were just local voluntary help or helpers from around Cape Town. And Mary wrote that when she first arrived, the doctor and two nurses were tackling the outbreak of typhoid on their own and were nearly done for, uh, as she quoted, and that she herself was soon, in quotes, nearly done for. Uh, but the situation improved a little when they acquired another two doctors three nurses and more orderlies. Uh, uh, at least she enjoyed some relief from the, this grim world of the hospital uh, when she visited Rudyard Kipling and his American wife Carrie. Uh, at the time, as you know, they uh, often, often visited uh, Cape Town and uh, the Kiplings used to stay at the Woolsack that Sizzle Roads provided for them that's in Weinberg. And if I'm uh, speaking correctly, it is now uh, a ladies' residence, a UCT ladies' residence. Um, and 
she would also meet up with him at the Mount Nelson Hotel in Gardens. Now, in his 1932 uh, memoir, uh, Kipling uh, said this about, about Mary. I just would like to read you this. Uh, it sums up her life at the, at the hospital and in Simonstown very well. He said, in the early days of the Boer War, she came to Cape Town of set purpose to relieve English nurses for work among our own peoples by helping to tend sick and wounded Boer prisoners at Simonstown, the naval station. Sometimes she would put into our house near Weinberg for what she called a Christian tea, sitting on the stoop, her hands quite still in her lap, and looking across the Cape Flats to the colored ranges beyond she would tell of single-handed night vigils of a fever-stricken men whose speech she hardly understood, and notably of hand-to-hand -hand campaigns in which, to do them justice, other prisoners came to her aid against a wounded Cape Colony farmer who had joined a rebel commando and was crazed with fear of being identified and punished when he should recover. His obsession led him to attempt stealthy escapes into the open at any hour of the night, and then Antley was overpowered and sat upon to fight to exhaustion. At times, uh, Mary would take a break from uh, hard work and then sit on the stoop of the palace barracks, where she had a, a wonderful view of the uh, of the bay, uh, of the ocean. Uh, and in a relatively short time, she endeared herself to her fellow nurses and also uh, to the to the Boers, uh, I will uh, get back to to her relationship with the Boers uh, in a little while, <clears throat> and uh, just to show how much they admired her. And now, according to one of the nurses there, Nurse Ray, she was from the Army Nursing Reserve. Uh, she said Mary was the one bright spot for us, always with some amusing tale when we were at our lowest ebb. Throughout this challenging time, Mary only had kind words for the Boers, in spite of the difficulties in nursing them. <clears throat> now, what Mary said about the, the Boers, she said, they are a most civil set of men. Those we have are mostly from the Bywona sharecropper, uh, in brackets, class, men with the big Boer farmers allowed to live on their farms and cultivate an allotment in return for services when required. But they are a courtly set of people. They never take a thing from you without a thank you. When they are not delirious, they obey every word you say. Now to her poor patients, she was an ever present angel. One man seemed to have little hope of uh, surviving and he eventually pulled through. And uh, his first words to Mary, uh, as she later recorded, when he uh, came uh, to again, he said, you are always here. And then she replied, count on that, stay in bed. And she described the Boers as being above all family men, but they were also men who loved their country and their independence. And those were qualities that she herself, uh, she herself uh, obviously understood uh, better than anybody else. Now, all the while, there had been efforts by some of the Boers to escape from the prisoner of war camp. Uh, that's the one at Bellevue that I showed you earlier. And <clears throat> then, uh, obviously, some of them got wounded in the process and they had to be brought in to the barracks hospital where Mary would look at them. Um, now, she was quite aware of the risk of uh, contracting typhoid, typhoid herself while she was nursing these uh, patients. And uh, I just want to quote what uh, she, she wrote in a book. Uh, she said, whether I shall come up out of this, like I came up out of what is associated with thinking proper, I don't know. It is a desperate game I am playing here and it is doubtful. One nurse and an orderly who have only been on two days are down themselves. But if I do not believe me, my dear lady, I am eternally grateful to you for all your tenderness, your infinite toleration and thoughtfulness for me. I who was and am and never shall be anything but a muddler. The stench, the washing, the enemas, the bedpans, the blood is my world. 
not London society, politics, that gateway into which I so strangely wandered. And she was also uh, said something about uh, having to catch large, powerful family men by the tail of their nightshirts at midnight, stand over them when they are sinking, tie up their jaws when they are dead. Five and six jaws a night have I had of late to tie up. So that were, those were the things that she had to con contend with uh, while she was working there. And uh, she did uh, take some odd precautions to prevent herself from falling ill. Uh, she was actually a teetotaler, but then she started drinking Cape wines to see if she could prevent falling ill. And she also uh, smoked cigarettes, and she believed that might give her some immunity from uh, infection. But then by the middle of May, she became feverish and she struggled to eat. And then other uh, of these typhoid uh, symptoms started to show. Uh, the familiar ones were headaches, dizziness, aching joints, nosebleeds, stomach ache, diarrhea, and delirium. So by now there was no doubt that she had contracted typhoid. And Nurse Ray, uh, when we mentioned uh, a little earlier, she recalled that when she got up one morning, uh, Mary complained of pain and she had temperature. So Nurse Ray put her to bed and she called Dr. Carre. And when he examined her, he decided to operate at once. And the uh, operation was successful and she regained consciousness the next day. But uh, by the evening, uh, Mary knew that she was dying and she asked to see Dr. Carre. And she made him promise to see to it that she was buried at sea. Now, Nurse Ray recalled she rallied for a short time, but realized she was going. She asked to be to be left to die alone, saying she did not wish anyone to see her in her weakness. Animals, she said, went away to die alone, and she felt like them. It was hard for us to do this, but we left the door ajar, and when we saw she was beyond knowledge, we went to her. Now, Mary died peacefully in the early hours of 3 June 1900. Uh, she was only 37 years old at the time. Now, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Carre arranged, as he promised Mary, he arranged uh, with the authorities for a burial at sea, and uh, a coffin uh, was draped in the Union Jack, and uh, it was uh, pulled through Simonstown uh, on a gun carriage, and then it was taken by launch uh, onto a torpedo boat, the HMS Thrush, and they sailed beyond Cape Point and they lowered Mary's uh, remains into the open sea there. Uh, I can just uh, show you that was the funeral. It, uh, there's the, the key there and uh, quite a few people you can see attending. This was the, uh, the gunboat. Uh, sorry, the, the, the torpedo boat. And now we were talking about the uh, the were prisoners of war. We had such a high regard for for Mary. Um, uh, they actually uh, they held a, a concert. They often held concert in the in their camps, but they uh, held a special concert uh, in the camp there in Simonstown to raise money for the Mary Kingsley Fund. So, you know, that is the admiration for, for her was, uh, was, was, was really very evident from, from these efforts, you know, for the, on this contribution for the fund. Uh, and they, uh, they actually um, sent out a notice to say, tonight there is a Christie Minstrel Entertainment in Building C in aid of the fund to the, mem to the memory of Mary Kingsley. Uh, that just shows you how much they they loved uh, this angel of mercy. Uh, and um, just to end this off, uh, in England, uh, in her honour, the merchants of Liverpool and Manchester, they established the Mary Kingsley Hospital in Liverpool for the treatment of tropical diseases. This is now a link to uh, uh, the the West Africa. Uh, 
And they also commemorated uh, with the founding of the Mary Kingsley Society of West Africa, and that was later renamed the African Society. Okay, that was um, a story on Mary Kingsley. Um, <clears throat> just to, uh, to get to this um, slide here, you can see this is a typical boer. That was a kind of guy that Mary Kingsley had to catch by the tail shirt at midnight in the hospital. Uh, now you see here the British forces. It's just to, a comparison uh, to show you how futile this this whole war had been from a from a world point of view. Uh, they didn't see it that way, of course, in the beginning. But if you look at the, the British forces, 347,000 imperial forces, and then the colonial forces, the, those are from uh, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, 103, 253,000 African auxiliaries, 100,000. And the Boers, you can see 25,000 Transvaal, 15,000 Free State, 6,000, 7,000 Cape Rebels, and foreign volunteers from mostly from Holland and Germany, uh, about 67,000. Um, now, of those, 26,000 were sent overseas. Okay, now we get to the next lady, uh, also from Canada. She was Georgina Pope, and she also became a military nursing icon in, in Canada. Now, uh, it, she was uh, baptized Georgina Fain Pope, and she was raised in a wealthy house, household on Prince Edward Island. Uh, of the east coast of Canada. Now, <clears throat> as such, she had the prospect of a comfortable and settled life, but she was determined to become a military nurse. Uh, just to quote her, she said, reading as a young girl, a most interesting account of Miss Florence Nightingale's noble work during the Crimean War, I became filled with a desire to become an army nursing nurse sister and go to the front. England, was happily at peace, and I much underage, so I was obliged to moderate my ardor. But with the main hope still uppermost a few years afterwards, I entered the training school for nurses attached to Bellevue Hospital in New York. Now, she was born uh, on 1 January 1862 in Charlottetown. Her father was a prominent, Father William, he was a prominent politician, so there was a lot of uh, politics uh, spoken in uh, their household and uh, the family home was one of the the most exquisite estates estates in in uh, in Char charlottetown and it had beautiful grounds and it had a very large library um, so uh, georgina could have had a comfortable marriage <clears throat> Uh, and she could have run a traditional family home and enjoyed the island's social life. But uh, instead, she chose not to marry. She gave her heart and soul to a nursing career, and she became a pioneer in the specialty of Canadian military nursing. Now, <clears throat> she, as she mentioned, uh, she attended the prestigious Bellevue Hospital School of Nursing in New York. She graduated in 1885, and then she took a, a job supervising a private hospital in Washington, D.C., and later moved to the Columbia Hospital for Women. And uh, as a super superintendent of nursing, she was asked to found a school of nursing, which was up and running five years later. Uh, then she returned to New York for another year at Bellevue, and uh, then in October 1899, she returned to Canada to seek a position as a nurse with the troops who were to depart for the uh, Boer War in South Africa. And just a few months previously, the Canadian Army Nursing Service had been established. Uh, and there was a... Uh, a contingent of a thousand strong Canadians uh, that uh, was going to go off to South Africa uh, to uh, assist the British there. And now accompanying these troops uh, would be a very small medical staff of three doctors and four nurses. And for the latter positions of the four nurses, 
there were no less than 190 applicants. And <clears throat> then Georgina, uh, she was chosen to head the small but experienced nursing team of four women to go to South Africa. I don't have to, uh, maybe I should just mention their names, Elizabeth Russell from Ontario, Annie Affleck from Ontario and Sarah Forbes from Liverpool in Nova Scotia. And they were given the rank and uh, remuneration of Lieutenant. They left Quebec for Cape Town aboard the SS Sardinian and the vessel, the vessel also carried troops. They arrived in Cape Town on 30 November 1899, <clears throat> soon after the outbreak of the war. And <clears throat> um, along with the usual battlefield wounds, there were also these large scale outbreaks of disease and infection. And before the uh, the battle at, at Paderberg, about 10% of the Canadian soldiers, they were unable to fight because of, of disease. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, when they arrived in South Africa, they uh, expected, the women expected to remain with the soldiers and go with them to the front. And the troops uh, were ordered to proceed up country immediately to Da'ar and to Orange River Station on the Orange River. And the uh, unfortunately for Georgina and the other three nurses, they were told that they would not be accompanying uh, the troops up north, and they were posted at the number one general hospital, uh, which was then the large base hospital at Weinberg Barracks, uh, which accommodated 1,000 beds. Uh, there was also a number two uh, hospital that was pitched on the canvas, also at Weinberg, and number three hospital close to Grutteskir in Rondebosch. And nearby in Clermont, there was a convalescent hospital for the officers. And in <clears throat> Greenpoint and Simonstown, there were these hospitals for the Boer prisoners, uh, like the one at, at uh, Palace Barracks that we mentioned when we spoke about uh, Mary Kingsley. Now, <clears throat> at this stage, the British uh, were advancing uh, along the railway line, the, uh, the Western railway line to relieve Kimberley. So they had these battles uh, at Margersfontein and Graspan and Belmont. This was in November. <clears throat> and they had uh, large numbers of wounded uh, brought down to Weinberg. Uh, so these were the, and then also from Margersfontein, and these were the wounded that uh, <clears throat> Georgina and her sisters that they uh, had to uh, to nurse, um, and she said the arrival of this convoy was a most pitiful sight. Many of these men being stretcher cases, shot through the thigh, foot or spine. What struck one most was a wonderful pluck of these poor fellows who had just jolted over the rough felt in ambulances and then endured the long train journey. Also the utter self-forgetfulness of everyone else surgeons, sisters, and orderlies, all of whom worked on regardless of time or hunger until everyone was as comfortable as they could be made. Okay, this is Weinberg Military Hospital. Here you can see some of the wounded arriving. Some of those buildings are still there um, <clears throat> in, in uh, Weinberg. Okay, let me just go back to here. Okay, back to the, the hospital at Weinberg. Now, during uh, this early period at Weinberg, with the exception of sunstroke, uh, most of those, almost all those uh, cases were surgical and operations would continue throughout the day uh, whenever the, a new convoy arrived with, with wounded. And they, they had an X-ray machine uh, already in those days and it proved invaluable in locating the bullets uh, in in uh, the soldiers' bodies. Now, <clears throat> after a few weeks at Weinberg, the Canadian nurses were transferred, along with three English nursing sisters, uh, on Christmas Day to number three General Hospital at Rondebosch, and Georgina took charge of the typhoid ward. 
There were 600 bids, and for the next five months, uh, she and her colleagues worked uh, in uh, in Ronda Bosch. Now, th now they had to uh, contend with the with the <coughs> Cape Southeaster in the summer month, and then the driving rain uh, in in autumn in winter. She said, uh, after a month spent in the huts at Weinberg, we went under canvas at Rondebosch, experiencing the adventures of camp life and the power of an African midsummer sun, together with sandstorms, rainstorms, and sometimes a too intimate acquaintance of scorpions and snakes. Now, you can just imagine for the people coming from Canada from these cold climates, you know, to, to come to Africa. Uh, to these harsh conditions, it must have been something for them. Now, during the uh, their time at uh, number three hospital, 30 patients died, but uh, it was a relatively uh, low mortality rate, um, which was due to the fresh air and the clean water, uh, the abundant fresh milk and eggs, and the daily supplies of fresh fruits from the Red Cross uh, Committee uh, of the Cape Colony. <clears throat> then at the end of February, four more Canadian sisters joined Georgina's nursing staff at number three, Ronnebosch Hospital. Um, and they were recruited in December from among those earlier applicants uh, in, in Canada. <clears throat> and these, uh, these additional uh, nurses, uh, they soon left Rondebosch for the Masonic Temple Hospital in Kimberley on the Western Front. Now, in uh, the first week of May, Georgina and the nine original nurses, they were instructed to proceed northwards to Kronstadt, and they left under Lieutenant Colonel Wood, who obviously was a medical uh, officer, and they arrived there on the 24th of May. And when they passed through Bloemfontein, they learned that uh, uh, enteric fever was uh, was rife, and the three uh, general and smaller hospitals they were crowded with with patients. Now, at the time, uh, Rudyard Kipling was a war correspondent for the Friend newspaper in Bloemfontein, and he was in in uh, in Bloemfontein at the time. And he estimated that there were, there were 8,000 cases of typhoid in Bloemfontein at the time. And that figure turned out to be quite accurate uh, compared to the official estimates. And <clears throat> uh, this officer Wood, he established temporary hospitals uh, there in Kronstadt, in ch uh, churches and even in the hotels. And these sisters, they had to work long hours they had shortages of medical supplies. They worked in extreme temperatures and uh, also with the ever-present fear of enemy attack, which they didn't have in, in Cape Town, at least. Uh, now, just to show you the inconsistencies of uh, supply chain management, she, she said they had a shortage of medical supplies but of condensed milk, beef tea, champagne, and jelly, we had plenty. And she also managed to secure clothing and food, and even whiskey and many, and many other medical comforts. Now, the number three hospital tents, they were pitched on the outskirts of Kronstadt, next to the Scottish uh, National Hospital, uh, which was uh, quite well equipped. Now, just to uh, quote her again on, on uh, to show the conditions they had to endure there. The weather was now very cold at night, the frost being thick both inside and out of our single bell tents. The patients being in double marquees did not feel the cold so much. We were scarce of water and lived on rations, which an orderly cooked for us on a fire on the felt. Dinner being a movable and uncertain feast on a rainy day. Around our camp, within 50 yards, were several six-inch guns. While we had prepared in a donga, a place of safety for helpless patients and a bomb-proof shelter 
for all the hospital staff in case of attack, which for some time threatened us daily. Hanging in our mess was a copy of orders to be observed when attacked, etc. Et Several mornings we awakened to hear the boom of guns, which however were never near enough to necessitate uh, using this shelter. How are we for time, uh, Fionnala? Okay, sorry, so. Chris. Uh, sorry, Chris. You've got 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. In Kronstadt, uh, the mortality rate was much higher than at the Cape uh, because the troops had been weakened by the hard campaign they had to go through, and then uh, they also drank the contaminated water of the Moda River, uh, so they fell easy victim to to the disease. And uh, they were in too poor a state to withstand the, the fever. Now, on the 31st of May 1900, Johannesburg fell into British hands. And then soon after, 5 June, uh, they occupied Pretoria, the capital of the Transvaal. And <clears throat> towards the end of June, the Canadian nurses at Kronstadt uh, were transferred to Pretoria, uh, where they were attached to the Irish Hospital, and that was accommodated in the Palace of Justice, the Afrikaans, the Palace van Justitie, people from Pretoria would know, and they dealt most, mostly with typhoid uh, cases. And by the 10th of July that year, the patient numbers had risen from 83 to a whole 500. And working conditions were difficult at first, but uh, at least the nurses found themselves in, in better uh, quarters. Now, when the year's contract was up, uh, the nurses were sent back to number one general hospital in Weinberg to await embarkation for Canada. Uh, but before then, they had 10 days leave and they used that leave to travel through Natal and look at the um, uh, some of the battlefields like Erlands Lachter, Kalenzo and Spionkop, the famous ones. And then uh, they arrived back in Halifax in Canada in January 1901. Uh, but as uh, fate would have it, uh, because of the continuing guerrilla war, war the uh, British uh, government appealed to Canada again to send another contingent. So 13 months after their departure from South Africa in December 1900, the f four of the original Canadian nurses, including Georgina, they had to return to South Africa along with four others. Uh, so they left for South Africa a second time on 28 January 1902. Um, <clears throat> so they reached Cape Town in March 1902, and then they journeyed to Harry Smith to join the Canadian 10th Field Hospital. And at first they were disappointed to find that the uh, 10th hospital had been sent to Newcastle, uh, so they were attached to the number 1019 stationary hospital near Harry Smith. And Georgina found Harry Smith, uh, a very pretty little town, about 6,000 feet above sea level, lying between the beautiful blue Drakensberg Hills and a fine copy called Plattberg, under whose shadow their camp was pitched. Uh, the nurses looked after about 600 patients uh, and about one third of them were suffering from enteric, uh, but their working conditions were relatively pleasant. And then on 31st of May 1902, the Peace of Vereniging was signed and the nurses, uh, remaining nurses were ordered back to Durban in June and they left uh, for Halifax. Uh, Halifax um, and by late July, Georgina was back in Canada by now the most experienced military nurse in the whole of Canada. Uh, a stint in the Orange Free State, however, had a tragic ending when a close friend, Sarah Forbes, contracted pneumonia in Harry Smith and eventually died of the illness in Liverpool in December 1902. Um, okay, um, then she also served in World War One. Uh, at the age of 55, uh, she embarked on a tour of nursing duties overseas in England and in France. 
And then in her retirement, she went back to live in Charlottetown and she died on 6 June 1938, aged 76, and was buried in the Charlottetown Roman Catholic Cemetery with full military honors. And now a military bust was uh, erected for in, in uh, for her to commemorate her contribution to Canadian military history, and it's part of the Valiance Memorial in Confederation Square in downtown Ottawa, as you can see there, unveiled in November 2006. Okay, so that was Georgina Pope. Are, are there any questions? Chris, do you um do you want to open now to questions in general? Um, shall we have a look and see if there are any? Okay. Okay. If you would like to ask ask a question, um, you can raise your hand or you can type it in the um in the chat bar. Chris, yeah, and, you think uh, you... as I like I said yesterday, we can have the same um, arrangement. If anybody wants to email me with a question, they're welcome to do that. Or any other questions, not necessarily uh, relating to to this lecture. Yes. Yeah, we can. I will uh, in a moment just type your email address in the bar. I think Kate has her hand up. Kate, would you like to ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, two very small ones. Um, the first image, it might not have been the first, but near, near the beginning um, in Simonstown, it looked as if uh, the prisoners were wearing masks. And I just wondered, I know we're all a bit sort of masked uh, obsessed at the moment. I just was quite, yeah, that one. Are they, they, they seem to, I don't know. Yeah, saying, I, yeah, they... typhoid? Yeah, I'm not sure if they masks or beards. I'm not, uh, you know, all the boys uh, had beards for some other, well, for some other reason. Uh, I'm not aware that they were wearing masks, um, but it, it's not impossible. But but as as a rule, they they didn't wear masks, as far as I know. Okay. But they 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 they, they most possibly or most probably beards. As you can see here uh, on on this uh, on this slide, yeah, they they were all they all had beards and moustaches uh, yeah, yeah. and all that. Yeah, all, the majority of them. Uh, and 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 the other one, you um, small detail again. Um, you mentioned um, Woolsack, um, now UCT residents being in Weinberg. Would would that have been Rosebank or would it have been Weinberg? Um, no, the the um, the three hospitals, were, you know, they were like I said, number one and two. They were in Weinberg, and then there was one in in Rondebosch. Uh, there was also the uh, another hospital near Rondebosch Common. Um, um, was it? It wasn't the Portland. I'm not sure about that name. Mm -hmm. But uh, but they were yeah. But they were in Weinberg and in Rondebosch. From the okay. you know all the information that we had. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, Elizabeth, uh, hi, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Handley asks, what about Edith Cavell? Um, was she on your was she on your list of um, of women you foreign women you you looked into? Sorry, are you looking? Are you looking at this list? Um, no, I just um, was she somebody that you wrote about? Um, no, she wasn't. She wasn't one of the. Uh, I had uh, twelve profiles, and they were <clears throat> mainly um, mainly nurses, and then also a few teachers, and then. Uh, Mary Kingsley was a, a bit of everything, you know. 
but she she was mainly uh, or exclusively concerned with with nursing during the Boer War. But the interesting thing was that you know she she was a very English lady and she didn't mind uh, nursing you know the Boers and she actually became very fond of them and uh, it's quite a close relationship be, uh, developed between the Boers and Mary Kingsley. You know, as I said, they they saw her as an angel. Uh, she, when they woke up, she was always there. It's, yeah, and it's also it's interesting to hear about the influence of Florence Nightingale on on at least one of these women, and and the sense in which like, nursing or war was in a strange way giving them the opportunity to be liberated to move away from home. Um, yeah, look, she, she, Florence Nightingale, Nightingale was was quite an icon in in those days, uh, you know, since the, the war in the Crimea, and um, a lot of these, uh, it, it, uh, apart from these ones that I've mentioned here, all those nurses uh, that came out to South Africa, they all said at some other stage, you know, they were very much influenced uh, by Florence Nightingale by her example. Uh, they looked up to her, you know, she was uh, she was a real icon of those mm. times. Um, Chris Fergus has a question. Fergus, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I mean, fascinating talk. Thanks. I mean, I, I'm calling from the UK. I have two great aunts, both of whom nursed in the Anglo-Boer War, um, one of whom actually was one of the uh, first people trained with a formal nurse training at Barts Hospital in London. Um, and I found, can find very little information about them from the sort of military records, British military records I can can access. Is it likely I'll be able to find more about them and more about their experience um, from any sources that you know about? You know, there's a, I don't have it with me right here, but there's a, there's a hospital, um, hospital archives in London. Uh, I also did a profile on a, a nurse called Clara Evans. Uh, she actually died in Bloemfontein, also of enteric fever. And uh, she's uh, still honored in one of the churches uh, in St. Helens. Now, I managed to to get a lot of information on her. You know, on her training, they still had her training records uh, in the archives where she was trained, you know, what she was trained in, uh, you know, even, um, you know, a performance uh, what she was good at and that kind of thing and you know reports from the uh the superintendent of uh, of of the training college and that kind of thing but if you if you email me i can send you the um i can send you the the address uh, of the archivist he was very helpful i must say okay. it was... all right that's very helpful i'll i'll email you in due course thanks yeah, I can just show. Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, he, yeah, the Bartholomew's Health National Health Trust in London, London Hospital Register of Probationers, Sisters and Nurses, Matrons, Annual Letters to Nurses, that kind of thing. So I'll send you that. And then uh, if you just contact this archivist there, he's been very, very helpful. Right, I think I may have already contacted them, but <laughs> so I was wondering if there are any local arc. I'll email you anyway. Yeah. Um, Chris, uh, I might be cut off mid question, but oh, there's a question from Susan asking whether Lieutenant Colonel Wood um, was related to Colonel Evelyn Wood, who fought in the Crimea as a boy boy and was commander of the forces in Kaiskamahuk in the Ninth Frontier War. Do you know anything um, about the woods? And not that I know of. He, he well, he, I don't know if he was a brother or whatever, but, but there were quite a few woods, you know, in, in these uh, frontier wars and in the uh, Boer War. Um, but I can't, uh, I can't answer for that. I'm, I'm not sure if, if they were related. 